So welcome everybody to uh, our Wednesday lecture. So uh, today's speaker is Bashir Tarui. Uh, Bashir is the director of body MRI imaging and cancer imaging, and uh, here at Mount Sinai, and uh, recently uh, named as the vice chair of translational research. So he's wearing a lot of hats, but uh, we work with Bashir a lot for his expert readings of our uh, liver patients. So today we're pleased to have him. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, so uh, I see new faces also. So uh, I'll be talking about imaging uh, methods for diagnosing fibrosis and cirrhosis. These are my uh, disclosures. Uh, just briefly, historically, when we uh, we started doing imaging of liver disease, we People were very interested at radio as radiologists to uh, in morphology. So morphology is still important these days, uh, and obviously there are signs, recognized signs of uh, liver disease that like distortion, irregularities, nodularity, reticular aspect, etc. These are already described back a long time ago with CT and MRI, and a little bit with ultrasound as well. Uh, for instance, segment four gets atrophied when you have advanced cirrhosis. You get multiple signs they can recognize. The problem is that these are really advanced uh, cases. So, and there are, like, I read every day, there are always a lot of gray zone uh, cases where you're not sure whether they're like three or four, maybe. Uh, these are the cases that are difficult to diagnose with uh, conventional uh, imaging. We're even talking about fibrosis. So, we list uh, this two years ago, we looked at about 140 cases with uh, with pathology, and we tried to just diagnose cirrhosis, F4, and you can see that morphology didn't do so well, uh, about 0 0.74 uh, for the best reader, uh, AUC, so it's pretty bad, actually, at diagnosing cirrhosis. Uh, Chapuk score, bad also. All the rest didn't do so well, right? You can see that we really need improvement. Platelet count, 0 0.7, uh, spleen volume, 0 0.6, uh, APRI, 0 0.7, so we really need better markers uh, of cirrhosis and fibrosis. So in terms of the imaging method you can use for uh, in order to blood test, which I'm not going to discuss, uh, for fibrosis and cirrhosis and poor hypertension, because really it's the whole spectrum I'm going to discuss, uh, include ultrasound elastography, you're probably very familiar already with MR elastography. But I'm going to discuss a little bit other methods at the end of the talk that are also emerging, uh, that include T1 mapping, uh, uh, DCMRI, uh, briefly, liver surface nodularity measurement, and also for the flow quantification. So I'm going to emphasize a lot on elastography. This is really an important method these days in 2018. This is the way to diagnose, uh, you know, assess liver disease and liver fibrosis. With elastography, you really have to apply stress uh, on the organ of interest, in this case, the liver. Uh, you can use shear wave propagation, basically, either as a transit impulse. That would be transit elastography. It's like one impulse, one measurement. Or you can do continuous dynamic excitation with RFE ultrasound methods or with MRI as well. And the resulting tissue deformation, once you apply the stress, you measure the deformation of the tissue, and that will give you the uh, mechanical property of the tissue. So you can do this with ultrasound MRI. Typically, there's some confusion sometimes when you read the articles. You see Young's modulus, so this is applied typically to ultrasound elastography. For instance, fiber scan is called E, or elastic modulus. This is measured in kilopascals, sometimes measured also in beers per second for the new ultrasound methods. And the shear modulus, which is G, where this is resistant to shear stress, this is a little different. This is mostly used for MR elastography. And there's typically a factor of three between the, between the two. So in other words, if you get a patient to get both ultrasound and MR elastography, the noise will be different. And the order of magnitude of three lower for MR elastography because the method is different. So uh, it's in terms of you know uh, basic uh, mathematics, basically the shear stiffness is mu uh, is measured as the product of tissue density and the square of the wave velocity. So tissue density is something you can really easily infer uh, in tissues, and then the wave velocity is something you can measure. Uh, once you apply the excitation, the shear uh, wave, you basically can measure the wave velocity with MRI or ultrasound, and then that will give you the shear stiffness. So uh, just to give you also an overview about quantitative, there are also qualitative elastography methods that are extremely, uh, you know, dependent on how much pressure you put on the probe. These are mostly ultrasound methods. They're kind of qualitative. They use them a lot in breast and thyroid 
you know, uh, ultrasound, but I'm not going to discuss that. So qu even quantitative electrolytes is something that can be really how pressure you, you want to put on the liver, on the intercostal space. But anyway, so these are the three main methods, so TE, RFE, and MRE. So TE, you already know, it's widespread use, it's very, it's cheap, uh, it has been very well validated. Um, the stomach area is small, still bigger than a biopsy, obviously. The ROI placement is going to be restricted, there's no guidance, right? So we don't know where you are, you can infer a little bit. You measure the Young's model is here in Kilo Pascals. Main reasons for failure and reliable results will be mostly related to weight, BMI, uh, for the MPRO, but also ascites. Uh, the RP ultrasound methods, RP stands for acoustic radiation force impulse. Uh, it's basically very similar to TE. The difference here is that you're doing dynamic excitation. Um, you are also looking at where you're measuring as well. So it's under ultrasound guidance. It's a regular ultrasound system that has a uh, basically a, a probe that does uh, and then also uh, software that does uh, elasticity measurement. The cost is also very low. Uh, the validation is still moderate to good because it's a recent technology. Uh, the liver stunning area is going to be larger than for our, for uh, TE, uh, at least for uh, shear wave, uh, shear wave uh, elastography for SWE. And you can see here there's some flexibility also with the uh, ultrasound guidance because you can really measure areas you want to measure. So that's interesting also for lesions. First, you want to measure lesions, for instance, in the thyroid or the breast or the liver here. Uh, this also you measure young modulus or wave speed in meters per second. There's a formula to get one or the other one. Uh, also limited by high BMI as well. So the other method I'm going to discuss is MR elastography. It's, where it's limited, it's more expensive, it has limited validation compared to ultrasound because it's more difficult to access. Uh, larger areas, probably the largest you can get, almost, you can get easily, you know, three or four slices with almost half of the liver easily. So it's much larger in terms of coverage. Um, here you're measuring what we call the shear modulus, which is about three times lower than this. And here the limitation would be iron deposition, larger size BMI, uh, and three tests like high field imaging. So, just a summary of the three, uh, the four methods again. Okay, Sorry, I'm yes. Ask, yes. You, on this? Three T, it has to be greater than three T? No, <laughs> actually, for this sequence called the GRE sequence, which is a first generation MRL elastography sequence, if you have iron deposition, a limit of iron deposition, it's going to be worse at three Tesla. So, you don't want to uh, use it at three T. So, three T is going to be problematic for that sequence, but we got away from it. So, we don't use it anymore. We're using a new sequence called EPI, which is less sensitive to uh, to field strength. It should be no difference between 1.5 and 3T. The number should be the same. So um, this is just, again, the uh, single excitation from TE, right? You can see coverage here. You can see approximately, I think it's the liver, but I can be 100% sure. I can be 100% sure this is the liver. I'm seeing it under ultrasound guidance. So this is PSWE or SWE, which is... The difference here is really the way the uh, excitation is uh, is produced here. You have a larger area of excitation here with some transversal, uh, you know, shear wave propagation, and the area of interest is going to be much larger than this, right? So, and you can vary the area, which is quite interesting. The problem with these two methods also is that you cannot measure deep in the liver. So, the vendors would tell you that all the vendors have this. Uh, major vendors like Hitachi, Toshiba, GE, uh, Siemens, uh, Philips tell you not to measure below, uh, you know, like l more than 3 cm, uh, you know, uh, deeper than the capsule of the liver, basically. So anything deeper than that would be unreliable. So that's one of the also disadvantages of this. Um, with MRE, you're going to be also sending continuous excitation using what we call a driver. So it's, uh, it's almost equivalent to a probe. Its difference is that it's just a piece of plastic that vibrates, basically at 60 hertz typically, and then you would send the waves in that, you know, they can go all the way down to the, uh, you know, to the kidneys and to the spine. You can really look at the spleen, you can look at the liver, pancreas, also there's people looking at the pancreas, and pancreas number is around here, so. But sure, oh. you always see these uh, maps that are so heterogeneous. Yes. Um, 
can you is that a parameter you can actually comment on, or is it not really quantified? That's uh, no. We of, of course you can quantify heterogeneity. So uh, most people actually have looked at this. Well, there's not a data actually. We have looked at this. We have the paper is not published yet, but we have looked at histogram distribution, and we found that the mean and the median were the best values overall at predicting uh, fibrosis. But you can certainly look at the distribution. Everybody, everybody yeah. complains about heterogeneity. Yes. Biopsy. Yeah. Uh, I guess you don't know a priori whether that the heterogeneity is as a result of different amounts of color. It's hard. It's hard to prove that because that means you're going to have to have biopsies in different areas. But clearly there is heterogeneity and that's why we recommend to use a large region of interest or multiple regions of interest and get an average of that, basically. That works uh, best. You also want to look also, which is kind of technical, you want to look at the wave distribution. And you want to measure in areas where you have better wave uh, propagation, basically. If you have attenuation of the wave, you don't want to measure there. So I think this is just repetition again. Just as your fiber scan system, I think we have, uh, we have two here in hematology. So this has been around for quite a time now. We can, this is the M probe, actually, not the XL. You have to put it in the intercostal you know, space. Uh, push not too hard, uh, and then you send the, uh, you know, the uh, excitation, basically, and you get a number, you have to do 10, number, 10 values, get a median value, and one of the quality control is that the IQR, which is the interquartile range, has to be below, I think, 30% or something like this. So that means you cannot have too much, you know, dispersion of the values when you're doing your measurement. They have to be within a certain range to be accepted as uh, as acceptable, basically. So you can see here, this is the mean value of the measurement, and this is the IQR given here of uh, 0 0.8 kilopascals. And the number of measures should be at least 10. These are some examples of fiber scans. These are from here, uh, two different cases I've derived to. Have. You can see the wide range of synthesis. I think typically, if I, uh, well, here the interest also of fiber scans is that there's so much data that we're able to really stratify by etiology of liver disease, which is quite interesting. So you're going to have a scale depending on the etiology that tells you what is the risk of having F2, F4, F3, F4. And I believe that here we're using, is it 12 we're using or 15 as the marker of F3, uh, Carissa? Or I can't remember, is it 12 or 15? Or it's 12, okay. So in this case, in a way, uh, this, this case had F2 and it had 12 kilopascals. So the accuracy is, of course, variable depending on the etiology and the patients. Uh, this is a very busy table. We did a very extensive review of this uh, in a review paper actually published this year. Uh, and uh, this is actually a review paper we did with uh, Laurent Castera uh, from France. So uh, we looked basically at major uh, publications with uh, TE from different regions. You can see from mostly from EU, from Europe, but there's a few from the US, a few from Asia. We tried to kind of mix. Uh, we went by you know historical, but also by number of cases. Most of the publications are looking at the M probe. Only one in the US looked at, well, the one we've shown here at least, uh, looked at the XL probe. The problem with the M and the XL probe is, uh, is that the values can be different. And I was actually at the NASH uh, biomarkers meeting, and nobody seems to be bothered by that. It kind of bothers me to say I'm getting different numbers, but then nobody seems to care. But anyway, so there's very little data on XL. Any clinical trials are correct for that? The cor is there a correction factor or something? I don't know what the correction is. It is different. The range depends on the probe. Correct. Uh, so, but you know, the point here is that mostly M probe has been used a lot in Europe. Actually, the XL has been, you know, used mostly for overweight patients and things like this. Uh, most of it is HCV, but it's a mixture. Also, HBV, NAFL recently. Um, you can see the success rate here in this colon is variable. It can go as low as 74%, you know, very low, and can go up to 92, 93%. So success rate means how many cases where it didn't measure anything and how many cases where it measured something, but it was not within the range of IQR you want it to be, basically. So that's two different things. Um, and then it will be unreliable. And then you can see the AUC for F4 is excellent, generally. It goes from 0 0.87 to 97, but not as good for F2, F4, okay? So as low as 0 0.73. So overall, it's been perceived as a good uh, marker of cirrhosis, obviously, when it works, obviously. So it does work in about 8 to 10% of cases, sometimes 25% of cases, when it works. It's a good marker for probably advanced fibrosis and, and cirrhosis. Uh, I think the best you could say for clinical trials now is increasingly trial designs are using this to improve, yes. you know, a, 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 a 
stiffness score of seven or eight uh, in order to go further and consider biopsy. Okay, good point. And it's also good, also, it's also, even if it's not that good for predicting F2A4 or F2A4, but at least it's good at looking at follow-up of these patients, basically, because it's relatively uh, reproducible and repeatable, because it means if you do different uh, observers, there's very little difference. There's some difference, but not as much as you want it. And then you can really use this, the patient as their own, you know, basic control and see what happens after treatment, which I'm not going to get into because it's all uh, a lot of the term that. So this is an example of the SWE system or SWE, PSWE. This is something we have here. Actually, we've been doing it uh, in research cases. Uh, we try to measure liver and spleen. So this is, of course, makes it easier because you can control uh, what you're looking at with uh, with TE, you cannot measure the spleen. It's very difficult because uh, it's you know people do it actually in Spain and people doing it. It's very complicated, but here you can really control uh, liver and spleen and you can really measure. You can see the difference uh, in ROI measurements. Huge difference between the MRI. This is the same patient and and the uh, and the ultrasound measurement PSWE with SWE getting a larger ROI now. So now we're doing also SWE. The numbers were, in this case, pretty similar, actually. You can see, well, slightly lower for ARFI, uh, but spleen was uh, equivalent. So SWE has, or PSWE, which is pulsed uh, shear wave uh, elastography, have lower, small number of data because it's more recent technology, as I said. Uh, but this, you know, reasonable data uh, from Europe, Asia, US, also, you can see HDV, HPV, NAFL, everything, with large sample size, like, for instance, the largest is from China, 549 cases, success rate 98%, amazing, really, really high. You can see the success rate is much better than with, with uh, FibroScan. So that's number one. It still fails, but not as much. And number two, uh, the F4 uh, data is very good, as good as, if not better, than FibroScan. And the F2, F4 data is very good also, as you can see, but the, the data is smaller. So I think overall... Uh, bottom line here, you're getting control of the, uh, you know, what, what you're doing, and also you're getting probably equivalent to slightly better uh, data uh, in terms of success rate, okay, compared to FibroScan. So limitations for both methods are, there's a lot of limitations. For instance, if you look at this paper from Castera 2010, 13,000 examinations, so it's huge data. It failed in 3% of cases, which is very small. But, however, if you look at unreliable, unreliable measurements, you're getting 15% more. So that adds up to about 18 to 19%. So it's about one in fifth had unreliable or failed measurements. And that's in France. So if you have obese patients, increased population of NAFL, that's going to increase significantly. Uh, BMI was identified as a significant contributory factor. DEX outprobe has improved this. For instance, this paper from the US 2012 looked at found that reliable measurements were found in about three quarters of patients with the XL probe compared to only half of them for the end probe using NAFL uh, data. So I, as I said, TE is not, uh, fiber scan is not suited for spleen measurements. If we think that this spleen is important, I mean, we, it's not demonstrated yet, but a lot of, there's a lot of interest in spleen measurements. We're finding factors also, flares, cholestasis, uh, heart disease. Remember that stiffness is not a direct measure of fibers is something, you know, just remember that. So if you remember that, then you got to understand that you can measure inflammation, you can measure uh, flares, you can measure, uh, you know, congestion from heart disease, cholestasis, etc. cetera, uh, you can viral hepatitis. The influence of steatosis is this conflicting data in literature. Uh, some people say it does influence the measurement. Some people say no. Um, my point of view is that it probably does. If it's really a lot of fat in that, it's probably going to make the liver softer a little bit but that's still conflicting. Um, and the problem with also SWE also, even if the failure rate is lower for both methods, the inter-vendor variability may be an issue. Because remember, FibroScan is a single vendor, so it's easy, although there are two probes with different values, but now we're talking about potentially seven or eight different vendors. And all of them will have different ways of processing the data, the images have different filters, then you're going to get maybe different values if you're doing a trial with this Phillips system or GE system, etc. So that has become, can become an issue as well. So I'm going to talk about MRE now. Uh, any questions about ultrasound elastography? This is really a quick overview. Uh, data is very strong, very good. Uh, but the, the issue again is going to be uh, the failure rate and also 
whether you will look at HEC screening at the same time. I think that's an important question as well. I think it's good uh, for certain patients probably when they have you know lower BMI and things like this. When you have patients with not it becomes probably more more difficult. So this is how we do MR allosography. Uh, this was done by one of my ex. Uh, uh, unfortunately, it's not going to work. Oh, it's working. Okay. Uh, ex postdocs who did this nice uh, video. Basically, a uh, patient is almost uh, is on the table. You basically put that um, passive driver so it's connected with uh, plastic tubing that goes outside the MRI room that vibrates. Basically, it's a, it's a stereo system uh, in a box uh, that vibrates and sends that vibration. You can control the degree of vibration. You can control the, uh, the frequency. You can go from 40 or 30 hertz to 90 hertz. Uh, the problem is that if you go higher frequency, there'll be more attenuation of the waves, basically. So you're not going to get any transmission. So you want to go in between. Typically, we use 60 hertz. It doesn't really hurt. I've been through this. Uh, it's funny. It's like a massage. It's a free massage. Um, but it's really, it's, and it's, very, it's fast also. It's only 10 seconds and done. So and then we do the measurement. But it's, done in, it's actually done inside the magnet. Right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. So we put this before. We put the patient inside. We strap it. And then we do the regular MRI, and then we do this at the end or at the beginning, whatever, depending on the on, on the protocol. So see, this thing is strapped around the patient. But you can do the full conventional exam with the uh, with, with this the thing. Driver on there. Correct. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't change. It's plastic. You can't even see it. Actually, you can see it's in pink there, but this yeah. is just a representation because it's plastic. You're not going to see it. So you usually put it on the right uh, you know right side of the uh, the patient uh, around the rib cage. And you're going to get this wave propagation through uh, the liver, the spleen. And then uh, you're going to use, this is basically a phase contrast method. You can look at the displacement of the waves and the thickness of the waves. And then by using what we call the inversion algorithm, you're going to get what we call stiffness map or elastogram, which also shows you some heterogeneity, like Scott was saying here. Increased stiffness, as you can see here, this is the, uh, the scale. And anything above four or five is considered to be cirrhotic, basically. So the scale is lower than for fiber scan. And anything red, yellow to red is bad. Blue is good, and green is intermediate. Uh, so you can see a lot of green, yellow, and red here. This thing is very stiff. So this is the, uh, the thing that produces the vibration. So this thing is called a, um, uh, it's basically uh, an active driver. It's usually put outside the MRI room because it's not MRI compatible. It has basically a, a, a speaker system basically that vibrates, uh, and then this goes to the patient. So this is one of our attacks. This equipment was at the end of 2017. That's about over 1,000 uh, in the world, over uh, 800 centers actually, expected to be over 1,000 by the end of 2017 uh, in the world. So there's a lot of them, obviously, in the, in the, in the East and Midwest and in California. So there's plenty more and more of these uh, coming up. Sure, is it reusable, the tubing? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. You said sterile, so... Well, it's not sterile, but it's something we... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we, we... I think the, the... I'm hoping that they clean that passive driver, the plastic. Actually, that costs a lot of money. And we have only one or two. We, we cannot change it every time. And now we have a flexible one, basically, that's less... That's more comfortable, that... But we're not so happy with the results. We're still working on it because we're doing uh, kidney as well, uh, kidney transplant, for instance, and we're using a flexible one. It's like a, you know, piece of cloth basically oh, that right vibrates around. right around <laughs> nicely. This is more rigid. It works very well for kidney transplant as well for fibrosis. Uh, this is the image processing. Uh, so we get a lot of images. I know it's a little complicated, uh, but basically we get multiple outputs. You get what we call a magnitude, so this is just a regular image showing you where you are, so that you're not mistakenly outside the liver. You want to make sure you measure the liver. Uh, it's very low quality. I mean, just give you like some guidance. This is the phase image. This is same uh, same image you get, for instance, for a cardiac, you know, uh, cardiac MRI when you measure, uh, you know, velocities and things like this. It's the same thing. And then you're going to do a wave image that tells you how if there's a good wave propagation or not. This is kind of quality control. Uh, and then you get it, the elastogram, basically. This is the most important image, this or this. This is the same, just colorized, basically. So what's important here also is that this one can be only, the, the stiffness can be measured on this confidence map. It, this confidence map tells you not to measure certain areas, basically. It will exclude automatically certain areas that have low 
signal to nose ratio, low propagation of the waves, basically. So, so that means you're not measuring the whole liver. In fact, you're measuring a big piece of the liver, but typically you've got to measure at least a third uh, of a liver slice with four slices. That's more than enough. So there's some examples uh, of MRI lithography. F1 to F4. You can see this F1 has very low stiffness, actually. So it can be called normal effects. Two, two kilopascals. Anything below 2.8, 2.9 is normal. Uh, 3.3, 4.1, and 6.2. So the limit is really between 4 and 5 when you hit that limit of F3, F4. So the difference here is that we don't have data per etiology. So we're using data for all comers, and it would be really good to have get a pretty charge like FibroScan did, but we don't have that. Yes? Sure. You said that uh, the wave propagation can be suboptimal. So yes. You would expect that it'd be closer to where the probe is, so that Correct. potentially near the capsule. Do you find and, and then fibrosis near the capsule tends to be a little higher than the rest of the We capsule. don't measure near the capsule. We never measure there because we know there's artifacts also because of the wave is there's some, you know, near, uh, you know, quote artifact and things like this. We like to measure it really deeper. It should be measured in the right place or the time, right here. We don't want to measure in this area. So. Yeah. Uh, okay, so performance is very good overall. I mean, there's papers from all over the world, different centers. Less data, you can see the, the N is much lower compared to FibroScan. You know, um, the largest probably this one with 539, probably from, from China. And the difference here with the fiber scan and the SWE is that it's not only good for F4, but it's also very good for F2, F4, as you can see here. Excellent data. So it can be really used to really, uh, you know, stratify patients with moderate disease. Not only severe disease, but also severe fibrosis, but also moderate fibrosis. So that's the, the bottom line uh, compared to, uh, to ultrasound methods. And you have more coverage also as well. So these are data from different centers. Uh, from uh, This is data, one of the first papers from Mayo Clinic. Uh, uh, this is from Europe. This is from Germany, Japan, uh, and Korea. Clearly, there are increased stiffness values, as you can see, with increased uh, score, uh, pathologic score, so either metavir or, or other parameters you can see. You can see nicely also there's a clear delineation of F2, F3, and F4, as opposed to FibroScan, where FibroScan actually F2 and F3 can be very often uh, kind of merge together, or F1, F2 would be merged as well. One of the nice things about that graph is if you look at collagen content, it also has a kind of a hockey stick. Mm. So there's modest changes in initially, initially yeah. even up to F3, and then F, the F4 has a clearly a distinct collagen content. So yeah. I mean, the, the device can't do any better than the amount of, you know, the variability of collagen. Well, yeah, that's actually a good point because, uh, you know, um, Dick Eman, who is one of the inventors of MRI lithography, keeps saying that if you have his AUC of 0 0.95, that's the max you're going to have. You can't have an AUC of 1 because the goal center is so, is so you know, is, is not good. I mean, it's, well, it's, it's good. It's not perfect. That's what I meant. So the pathology is imperfect, basically. So you're not going to get one of AUC. So 0 0.9 is already extremely high. So what we also thought would be interesting to look at the visual assessment of these nice color images. So anybody from the end of, from that door can say, this is blue, this is blue and yellow, green, and the other one is more red. So, and we came up actually with this classification, visual classification like takes 30 seconds to, to look at images and say, this is what I teach my fellows. So zero, one, and two. So zero will be no fibrosis, one will be far, some degree of fibrosis, and two will be advanced for cirrhosis. And that is actually, the ESO is almost 0 0.8. Just looking at images without measuring anything. And this is the biopsy? Uh, oh, yeah, all biopsy proven, yes, yes. Uh, so just some other examples. I think I'm going to pass this. Uh, this actually is a case I want to show because FibroScan had 20 kilopascals, which is really high. It was discordance, and uh, we were not sure then. Actually, I'm going to show normal liver stiffness. So which one do you believe? I mean, <laughs> um, it looks morphologically normal, but that doesn't mean anything. But this patient probably had some minimal fibrosis. So in terms of comparing MRE with other, you know, uh, I think this is really an important uh, question. How does it compare with FibroScan? There's this excellent paper actually dating from 10 years ago already, uh, over 140 cases. Uh, this is a Belgian paper that showed that MRE had not only a better success rate than FibroScan in the same patients, but also better 
diagnostic accuracy compared to FibroScan and, and APRI, which is a uh, blood test for fibers. You can see here, again, the distribution of MR stiffness, really, you know, nice separation. While with the uh, ultrasound, you know, with the FibroScan, you can see overlap between F1 and F F2, a little bit with F3, and also same thing with the APRI, with the, with the blood tests. There's also another paper more recent from Japan looking at the NAFOL patients from 2016, where they looked at about 142 cases with NAFOL compared MRI to TE for grading steatosis and fibrosis. Now you can do uh, you can do CAP, right, with the fiber scan. You can measure attenuation, and that can infer uh, fat fraction. I don't know if you don't get here clinically, but people do it. And they found that there was a higher area under the curve with MRE versus TE for F2, F4, and also for cirrhosis. You can see uh, excellent already for TE, but it was not, it was even better uh, with, with MR osteography, and it was much better for F2, F4, 0.91 versus 82. Uh, so markers did not provide additional information. And also importantly, in these Japanese patients, TE fell in 10% of the study cohort, while MRE measurement was successful in all included subjects. So I just want to make a point here that MRE fails, unfortunately, also. I mean, in Japan, it didn't because they're better than us. But here, we, we think it fails in about 5% of cases, approximately, which is reasonable. So this is our experience uh, looking at different markers. But you can see, again, here, uh, MRE had a nice separation of 3 and 4. And F1, F2 were overlapping here, actually. But F3 and 4 were much higher compared to, for instance, uh, fiber scan. So limitations of MRE, the failure can, can happen in patients who are in the position. Using this first generation sequence is confounded, like I said before, for ultrasound by inflammation, um, uh, congestion, cholestasis, and things like this. It's expensive, no reimbursement. There's actually, we're working on the CPT code. Hopefully, it's going to happen next year, where we're going to have the same uh, same price as for, I think, a pelvic MRI uh, without contrast. So it's going to be a smaller amount of money, but that's going to be specific for MRI osteography. So this is an example of a patient with severe iron deposition uh, based on the T2 star image. You can see completely failed MRI. When you see checkerboards, on the images, that means no good. Okay, so but if you if you do a API sequence, this is the new sequence we're running now. You can really get good measurements uh, in the same patient. So yeah, this is basically just give you technical failure about three point five percent. So using the GRE sequence, um, it was higher at three tesla. This is why I mentioned three tesla initially. So and then, anyway, this is not an issue anymore because the sequence here. Uh, is not used uh, in our institution, so we don't use it anymore. But we scan time, time is actually shorter with API, so it was it's four times shorter. It's uh, much much better and more coverage also as well. So we found that BMI, uh, liver iron, massive ascites, uh, uh, alcoholic liver disease were all associated with with failure of alcohol. You're more likely to have probably more severe uh, liver disease, I guess. But on multivariable, only BMI. Liver iron, massive ascites, and TWT were associated with the uh, with failed cases. So the people from Mayo Clinic didn't agree with the uh, with the BMI and the weight because the, in their experience they didn't think it was a, a factor. But I'm firm believer that weight uh, and abdominal circumference is a, is a player uh, in ultrasound and MRI osteography as well. So you get the you get a value, which is not a factor. You can get a value because you're going to get something you like this. Well, you can, you can measure it, but it's going to be completely unreliable. Yeah. So just want to make the point also about the reliability of the measurements. So the IQR, we don't do IQR with MRA as well. Usually we just measure on a confidence map. That's enough. So there's no, you can apply IQR, but typically we do not. So it's, it's not as strict as it is for, for ultrasound. So this is a typical example of somebody with abdominal pain, acute increase in LFTs with HCV. So this was probably just from acute flare uh, of liver disease with the inflammation on biopsy. And you can see the symptoms is extremely high. So just again, remember that stiffness is not a direct measure of fibrosis. So future prospects, uh, there's a lot of things we can do. Improve, obviously, web delivery, because sometimes it fails, whatever you do. Uh, 3D is one thing you can, we're working on. Actually, we've been applying this for the last uh, six months, where you can really measure the whole liver 
and you can also get additional uh, viscoelastic uh, properties uh, other than shear stiffness. You can also look at longitudinal long changes after uh, therapy, part hypertension, risk of HCC and HCC response. So this is uh, an example of a patient with HCC treated with uh, radial mobilization. Uh, you can see uh, changes uh, in stiffness. Uh, this is uh, initial HCC. This is initial uh, pretreatment, and then you can see major changes in, in stiffness. Uh, went from uh, 11 initially to 2.6, so it goes down as the, the tumor becomes more necrotic. So this is something really interesting. We're interested into looking at whether this can predict also ultimately the response uh, to to therapy. So I was mentioning the EPI. This is what we're using now. Uh, it's it's better than GRE because it covers more. It's quicker, uh, and it works in in. We need to have data actually on uh, fibrosis. We don't have that data. There's very little data on this, but we're hoping that it's going to be equivalent to uh, the first generation uh, sequences. And this is the 3D acquisition. This is something we started doing here, uh, looking at additional parameters. So still not only stiffness, but also what we call storage and loss modulus. These are kind of visco elastic uh, properties. Uh, there's no data to show that this is adding any information where we're currently assessing this in patients with poor hypertension. So this is an example of poor hypertension again. Uh, liver and spleen, we're actually doing, it's a little crazy now what we're doing, we're doing uh, uh, concomitant acquisition. So we have two drivers at the same time, one on the right, one on the left, uh, connected to vibrates at the same time. So and then we're getting images of liver and spleen at the same time. So this is some initial data. Uh, this is actually a, a new grant we just got. Basically, this is data from the grant initially, where we found that if you want to correlate with polar pressures, if you use a ratio uh, shown here of liver stiffness to what we call liver upslope, this is measured with the with DCMRI with the galenium. Basically, you get 0 0.9 AUC uh, for predicting polar hypertension, meaning uh, polar pressure over equal five. Uh, millimeters of mercury, but for clinically significant portal hypertension, it was not as good. It was almost 0 0.785, but it was the best marker. And this is only in 30, 30 cases, so we're hoping to do this in a larger number of cases. So uh, we're also looking at 40 flows. So this is another method that's important also, I think, for portal hypertension, particularly where you can look at the flow velocity uh, of all the vessels in the mesentery, so of the splunking vessels, that includes not only the veins, but also the arteries, which is harder. We're looking at uh, portal vein, uh, SNV, splunking vein, uh, velocity. You can also look at directionality of the flow. You can see the, the mixing of the flow here between the SNV and the, uh, the splunking vein. So you can really quantify all these, what we call particle imaging with, uh, with software. And this takes about four minute acquisition, it's pretty quick, free breathing. With a cardiac trigger, so we're looking at the we call it 40 flow because it is a volume acquisition with cardiac triggering. So we're looking at the cycle, uh, cardiac cycle over time. Not as important for the veins, but very important for the arteries. And uh, yeah, so this is something we're we're very interested in. Uh, we're also interested in other markers like T1, for instance, T1 mapping. So T1 is a is a inherent biologic property of tissues. They can measure with MRI with relative good, uh, good precision. Uh, it takes about the breath hold, so about 10 seconds you can get the T1 value of the liver. Uh, we have shown, for instance, that if you measure the T1 before and after galaxetic acid aorist injection, you can really look, uh, you can predict the severity of liver disease. So this is an example of a cirrhotic liver. You can see differences in T1 values. It's more dark on the uh, on the top the top case, which is not cirrhotic, than it is on the other one. They can really measure that to predict severity of liver disease eventually. We're also interested in uh, liver surface nodularity measurements. So this is uh, a cool software. Actually, we uh, we got from uh, a group in Louisiana where the uh, group of engineers have come up with this. So basically, you trace the liver surface it makes a lot of sense in green, and then you will measure basically how irregular it is and how nodular it's going to be. You get basically a score based on that irregularity. You can see uh, this is a non cirrhotic liver with CT and MRI, and cirrhotic liver, you can see the scores are much higher uh, with the uh, with the cirrhotic liver. So uh, we have 
looked at this in comparison with other markers, but we found it to be actually disappointing at this point, unfortunately. They were not really happy. Uh, complete overlap of the values of nodularity. So it seems to work better for CT. Maybe it has to do with the spatial resolution and the contrast of the images, but it didn't work so well for us. It worked, this is another study actually we did last this year where we looked at MRE again, much better than blood tests and much better than nodularity uh, score based on this uh, liver surface nodularity measurement. Uh, and then I want to mention uh, briefly also multi scan. So this is so a lip score. Uh, this is really um, uh, came up recently. This uh, startup company from England who uh, developed this T two star corrected T one basically. So it's the same T one I showed you earlier, but it's T two star corrected. So basically they uh, provide images of what we call the corrected T one, which is in color, and they claim that this can be a good marker. There's actually a couple of papers, solid papers, showing that it can be used as a marker of uh, disease severity in Nafold, mostly in Nafold. It's not necessarily a marker of fibrosis, but it's more kind of a marker of, you know, all the typical findings of Nafold, meaning ballooning or inflammation and things like this. But we need uh, we need more data on this. Um, okay, I think that's all uh, I wanted to show. I mean, basically to summarize, I think ultrasound elastography is an excellent technique. Uh, it will be, you know, it can fail, it can be unreliable, and in cases where you need, I think, a good method for HEC screen or characterization or better characterization of liver disease with fat, iron, and, and stiffness, MRI is the way to go because you can do that in 10 minutes, basically. You get all the information uh, quickly, so, uh, yeah. Okay, any questions? <laughs> Just to be clear, so if you do uh, like for a clinical trial, it can do an ACC uh, screening, but is that your fast MRI? Well, that means for the fast MRI, well, there's two, ten, two ways to do fast MRI, abbreviated MRI. You can do it without use of contrast, so then yeah. you're going to get the fat content, the iron content, and the stiffness measurement. Right. But you don't get, the HCC is going to be very limited, HCC screening. If you want to do HCC screening, we need to use contrast. So delayed, you know, enhancement, basically we inject and then we, and then it's going to be the same time, but we need to inject contrast. And can you do um, uh, corrected T1 and MRE in the same patient at the yes. same time? Yeah. So you could compare the, the You could do that, yeah. You can do T1. We actually currently, with the portal hypertension cases, we're looking at T1. Uh, we're going to hopefully start looking at corrected T1 by doing T1 on our own. Uh, we're looking at other markers as well, not only uh, MRE, but other things. Sure. Can you remind us, providers, how we would be able to obtain an MR elastography? Okay, so you can either request a regular MR. For now, we don't have a CPT code. So once it comes available, I'll let you know. But for now, you just need to request a regular MRI abdomen uh, with contrast, I'm assuming, because these patients need HCC screening, and then add MR elastography. So we just add it for free, pretty much. So it's going to be added to the protocol. And it will give you a measurement and a uh, risk score, basically, uh, like a fibrosis score based on the measurement. Another question. So you have to be specific about asking for it. In the like, comments section. Correct, right? yeah. So um, are there various markers for understanding the risk of decompensation in ceramics? Right? Uh, the portal pressure measurements, again and again, seem to be the best. And, uh, you know, regardless of sort of how basic you can get things. So with that flow diagram that you showed, you know, that, that where you can measure caliber and flow, assuming you'd be able to measure Pressures. How far are we away from MR or other modalities being able to give us a portal pressure measure? Well, it's not going to give you direct measure of the pressure. It's going to be indirect measure, basically. So it's something we're we're working on, basically. So we did 15 cases at this point with uh, the portal pressure measurements. So, but you can't really get directly the pressure. So you're going to get flow measurement. You're going to get velocity, directionality, all of that, and and you can probably infer indirectly. Uh, in combination, maybe or not in combination, what the degree of portal hypertension is going to be. But we don't, have, we don't have data yet. We have actually we have a paper actually in press where we looked at not HBPGs. So we just looked at the degree of uh, liver disease with chai pube scores and things like this. It seems to be working well. I would say not amazingly well, but uh, we need to get you know portal pressure as the endpoint. Have you done any uh, patients you know, experimentally or otherwise? Following, let's say, HDB cure to show a decrease in stiffness? 
I, I, I love to do that study, but, but unfortunately, there's no, it's funny because there's no published data actually from MRE. There's a lot of data from FibroScan and maybe from SWE, but uh, no, we don't have that data because, you know, it's so easy for the patient to get just a FibroScan, you know, I guess in and out. And so, no, we don't have it. And I don't think there's any data in literature. Um, it's no. But we know so a lot of yeah. you know, phase 2A trials now are building their, their case around non invasive images yeah. to, for proof of uh, principle. Right, right. It's one thing to prevent progression, but it would be nice if you had some bona fide example where you've actually regressed consistently. I don't have, uh, I don't have that data, unfortunately, uh -huh. yeah. Yes. So there is some data yes. like that that was presented at SLD last year. With FiberScan? No, with the oh. T1. Oh, we corrected T1 and, and an HCV treatment. Yes. Okay. No. I'll send you those slides. Yeah. Better treatment in that situation, is there a way to kind of distinguish if it's regression and fibrosis or just improvement in inflammation? No. Yeah, there's no um, biopsy data. Uh, well, certainly not for a stiffness measurement. I don't think for corrected T1, would that discriminate between? No. I mean, I think T1 would be more likely to, more likely to a kind of inflammation, I would say. But there's a lot of overlap, unfortunately. So, and then you need, you know, serial biopsy data, I and mean, nobody has that data. I think there's very little. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is, regardless of what's comprising that score, it still has prognostic in, 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 you know, value. So, if you have a decrease in stiffness, for example, whether it's inflammation or fibrosis, it's yeah, a good thing, right. and it correlates with better outcome. So, at the end, what matters is really the outcome. Is it is the patient responding? And yeah. and also, what is the risk of HEC? That's also there's data actually looking at risk of HEC. Based on stiffness from uh, from mostly from fiber scan actually, so yeah, yes. Is uh, the mostly scan come with a PDFF uh, as well? Yeah, well, PDFF we do anyway. So without okay. if we use uh, corrected T1s, they're going to be for PDFF. We, we we have that. So that's a minor, uh, you know, additional. But this is how they market it. They, they see market it. They can give you PDFF and corrected T1. But for us, uh, PDFF is not important. Is it PDFF Yes and no. Uh, the funny thing is that all the vendors have PDFF now, but they will make you pay for it, which is crazy. So we have it only in a few systems. We have it in about maybe four systems out of 12. It's not bad. But uh, so if you really need PDFF, like you need really liver fat quant, uh, we have to we have to specify it. Same thing like you do for MRI. Yeah, specify liver fat quant. Then we can do it on the system that does it. If you if it doesn't happen that system, we can do it the old-fashioned way, which is Fat fraction, so you're going to see in reports, fat fraction or PDFF. PDFF is the precise one. Okay. Well, I think we'll end here. Thank you again. Okay. Thank you.